Thank you very much for inviting me. It is always a pleasure to be here in Brazil and also here in, in San Carlos. Uh, I will talk a bit about uh, models, not so much about the details of modeling, but more about the applications of modeling uh, in the industrial biotech uh, area. Uh, but first I would like to tell you a bit where I come from. Uh, so I come from the northwest uh, part of, uh, of Portugal, it, it, which is the Minho region, uh, not far away from, from Porto, uh, which is well known for the, uh, uh, the Vinho Verde, the, the green wine, uh, and also for the codfish, the bacalhau. Uh, we live, although we, do, we wouldn't associate a green uh, landscape with Portugal, uh, that's actually uh, our landscape is quite, quite green and hilly. And the old town, uh, and what you probably don't associate is with our university, that's a relatively new university, a technical university. Uh, so in our team, uh, we work a lot in silico, although we also have some uh, in vivo uh, projects. Uh, and we are mostly focused on industrial applications. And uh, as Roberto said, I'm also involved in two companies uh, that were spin-offs uh, spin of, uh, of our group, uh, because we are very much focusing on, on, on practical applications, although some of the things that we uh, do are, are quite theoretical. So we do a lot on modeling, uh, psychometric dynamic models, <coughs> regulatory models, how to reconstruct these models, and mainly how to use these models uh, for metabolic engineering applications. <laughs> so this is uh, all related uh, with the biorefinery concept, although of course it's related to many other things, but if you think about the biorefinery process um, in a broad view, uh, you are interested in obtaining uh, strains uh, that are able to produce a variety of compounds uh, or different strains that are able to produce a variety of, of compounds uh, apart from uh, what we already produce, like that are biofuels, some acids and, and so on. Uh, but in order to do that, we still have a long way to go. Uh, because although we know a lot on the metabolic uh, pathways uh, of, of, of the cells, and we know, for example, I usually give this example uh, because you know that most of the organisms that we know, we, we know have the ability to produce succinate and other uh, 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 TCA cycle intermediates like fumarate. And these compounds are quite interesting in, in, from an industrial perspective. Uh, but the problem is that although most organisms are able to produce these compounds, they are not producing them in uh, amounts that we can even measure because they are intermediates. Uh, so it happens like this for a lot, for a lot of, of, uh, of different compounds, uh, that the cells have the ability to produce them but do not produce them in, in, in amounts that uh, are interesting from an industrial uh, perspective. Uh, so the, the main... Uh, um, idea of, of our work is to start with the raw material, targeting a product that maybe the cell already has the ability to produce or not, or then we have to insert a nephrologous pathway. And how, how do we direct the metabolic fluxes from the raw material to the product, uh, at the same time avoiding uh, the formation of byproducts uh, that will compete for the raw material and also will be contaminants in the, in the end uh, uh, product. Uh, this is of course not trivial uh, and this, this image is, is on purpose uh, complex because there are so many different uh, interactions, so many different reactions and the way we looked at metabolism uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago was probably not the, 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 the most uh, appropriate one for these purposes because we used to look at it as a flat thing, as a, a, a bidimensional uh, 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 thing. And uh, what we know to, today is that uh, the reactions, uh, even though they happen in very uh, different pathways, they are connected because uh, of compounds that exist in the cell, like ATP and ADH, uh, that uh, uh, interact, that help this, this uh, uh, high degree of, of connections. So the question is how, even if we know a lot on metabolism, how do we solve this problem of taking a raw material and producing uh, interesting amounts of a target product. Sorry, this was... <laughs> so the, the approach that we use is, is, is uh, related with metabolic engineering, and metabolic engineering 
as opposed to other strategies, is focusing on uh, the, the introduction of directed genetic modifications. And that implies that you know a lot on the metabolism and on uh, uh, the pathways of the organism that you have chosen. And we might be talking about overexpressing some genes, deleting other genes, and adding new reactions uh, between other uh, approaches like manipulating the environmental conditions in order to have uh, the best environmental conditions for, for your production. And the way we look at this problem uh, can be represented as it is here, and it's more an engineering approach to this problem, is that we should be able to simulate a phenotype based on different genomes. When I say different genomes, I say genomes that are uh, uh, evolved from a wild type. Uh, so we should be able to understand uh, the effect of making changes in the genome, how it affects the phenotype. And we should be able to do this in simulations, of course, because then we are able to simulate thousands, uh, uh, millions of different genomes. And then each phenotype will be associated with a given uh, value for our objective. And our objective is usually uh, the maximization of the production of a target compound. <coughs> uh, and if we are able to do that, and if we're able to simulate millions of different modifications in the genome, then we can choose which ones have the best uh, uh, value for our uh, objective. Okay, so this is in an, in an ideal world uh, where we'll, we would be able to simulate the behavior of the organisms. Uh, I will tell you what we can do now with the current knowledge and the current tools. Uh, but first I would like to tell you that in order to to, to perform some of these uh, tasks, uh, it's very important that we have accurate mathematical models that represent what happens inside the cell, good simulation methods uh, in order to predict the behavior of the cell based on these models, and also robust and flexible optimization tools that are able to tell us what kind of genetic modifications are good to maximize the production of our uh, compound. So going first through the models, uh, these are some of the, the phenomena that we would like to represent in our models. This is the metabolic part. Uh, the first level is to know which reactions can occur inside of an organism. Uh, and for those reactions, to know which enzymes uh, are, are responsible for their catalysis and also which genes that we call metabolic genes are associated to uh, each enzyme and to each reaction. Of course, this is not a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one, uh, relationship. And for each gene, we sh should also be able to understand how this gene is regulated. It can have several promoters, and each promoter can be regulated by different proteins, like transcription factors or sigma factors. Uh, and if we know all this, uh, we can have a good representation of the genome and how it impacts the phenotype. For example, uh, organisms like E. coli, uh, we know that uh, more or less half of their genes are genes that codify for enzymes. So if we are able to know all of this uh, uh, relationship between enzymes and then the reactions, we can already predict the effect of changing half of uh, the genes in the genome. Uh, and if we add to that metabolic layer the regulation, then we add, I don't know how many, nobody, I guess nobody knows, but we, we can add already some hundreds of new uh, genes into our prediction capabilities. Of course, one, one, one uh, layer is to know the function of each, each gene. Another layer is to understand how this reaction takes place uh, inside the cell, how, what is the kinetic of, of of this reaction and how did it responds to environmental factors. And we should be able to also to contemplate that. What I put here is one kinetic expression that I randomly shows for you to, to understand the complexity of kinetic expressions uh, that need to be written for each individual reaction. And again, going back to the, the case of E. coli, uh, we could go to Saccharomyces, but E. coli is probably uh, more characterized in terms of uh, uh, the number 
of genes that codify for enzymes. Uh, we think that E. coli might have around 2,000 uh, genes that codify for enzymes. And we, would, we should be able to write these kinetics here for each individual of uh, enzyme. Uh, so you can already understand the complexity of this task. And this is also to tell you why we don't have this information at the moment. So we have uh, this detailed information on a very small part of these enzymatic reactions that occur inside an E. coli cell. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is because people have given up on collecting this, this data. Uh, and nowadays it seems that people are going back to this uh, problem in a high throughput perspective, trying to characterize individual enzymes. Uh, but most of the data that we have is uh, from the 70s or, from, or even before uh, in the characterization of individual um, enzymes in, in terms of kinetics. So the message is we don't have this information yet and that would be the information that would be useful for making predictions from, uh, uh, for, a, for a particular organism. But since we don't have that information and since we are talking of metabolic engineering and we want to know the effect of changing one single gene in the phenotype, we should have as many genes in, in our models as possible. Uh, so our models are usually not as detailed as we would like. So here in this table, uh, I represent three uh, different uh, types of models that we use for simulations. Uh, and the first type of model is the, the stoichiometric model where we only have the representation of the genes, the corresponding enzymes that they codify for, and the corresponding reactions, including the stoichiometry of, this, of these reactions. Uh, using the, the data from the genomes, we are able already to have these models for a variety of organisms, but actually the accuracy of these models is not as good as we would like. So we have to uh, be careful with the, the results that we have, although there are several proofs of concept that uh, these models can be used for several uh, approaches. One of the things for metabolic engineering applications that we are able to do with these models is uh, to perform the effect of gene deletions, which is already quite useful uh, because many often, in order to have a, 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 an engineered uh, 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 organism, one of the first approaches is to think on how to uh, redirect the flux uh, uh, for our uh, target compound, and one of these approaches is to delete certain genes. Uh, what we cannot do with these models uh, uh, very well is to perform uh, predictions on gene over and under expression. If we already have the regulatory part of, this, of these uh, uh, organisms, if we already know that, then we improve the accuracy. Uh, and if we do have this kinetic information, we of course improve the accuracy uh, and we are able to do all the kind of simulations. But like I said, the problem with these kinetic models is that we don't have enough information to, to build those, those models. So, because of that, the first uh, models that we use are the stoichiometric models because those are the ones that we can easily construct. And those are based on uh, uh, the stoichiometry, like I said, for example, for this compound here, if you do a mass balance, and this is, I promise, this is one of the few equations in my presentation, but it is, I guess this is quite important. So for this compound here, if you do a mass balance, this will come more or less like this. So the variation of this compound uh, is proportional to the rates of formation minus the rates of consumption for that compound. And using this uh, 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 first principles uh, equation, if we add here the kinetics, then we have a model that we all would like to have. But the problem, like I said, is that we don't have, uh, we don't know uh, uh, the behavior of this rate here and of this one here, so we have to use another mathematical approach in order to make predictions. So, what we do is to assume a, a steady state inside the cell, which it's proven that it's uh, 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 often true when cells are growing, for example, in, a, in a, an exponential phase or in a chemostat uh, um, or, or close to, the, to, those states, to those states. So what we do is we assume a steady state and then this equation 
uh, becomes equal to zero, which means that our variables will be the rates of each reaction. So if we here have these two uh, compounds, uh, this V1 is the rate of transformation of this into this, and this equation would represent uh, 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 the fact that this compound is not being accumulated, so it's in a steady state. If we do this for all the compounds uh, that we know that exist in the cell, then we end up with a matrix And I, I had it this year for you to understand more or less how it works. So here it's, it's a, 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 of course, very simplified cell with just a few compounds and, and some uh, reactions. And what we do, the way we build the models for this cell here, uh, is that we first build a psychometric matrix that basically says, uh, uh, represents what I just described in the previous equation. For, so, for example, for the compound B, you have here this row that says that compound B is involved in reaction 1, 2, and 4, which you can immediately see here that it's the case, okay? So this is the stoichiometric matrix that tells us how the, the, the compounds interact with each other. And apart from that, we should also know something about the bounds of uh, the, the each individual reaction. So having this, this is quite nice because it's, this is a, a, a linear model. Uh, and as you know, uh, having a linear model is much easier to perform simulations. Uh, but the problem here is that, uh, uh, like in this example, uh, these systems are underdetermined, which means that these systems are accurate because they represent the stoichiometry of the cell. Uh, but they don't allow us to perform uh, 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 predictions because they are underdetermined. That's how it should be, right? Because we are only using uh, the stoichiometry, so there is lots of degrees of freedom because the cell can behave in many different ways with that stoichiometry. I'll go back to this later. I just wanted to, to, to talk to you a bit about how to construct these models on a large scale because that's what we want. Like I said, we want to be able to predict the effect uh, of, of changing uh, uh, and, uh, the expression of uh, the maximum number of genes. So we want to account for the maximum number of genes, so we want to have models that account for uh, as much as possible. And we call these models genome scale models because we start building them from the genome. So what we do is to look at uh, the genome uh, the results from a genome annotation. Nowadays, pretty much all the interesting organisms are sequenced and the, 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 the genome sequence is available. So we look at those results from the genome annotation and then we go uh, and look for other information in, in databases and also in, in the literature and we combine this information in order to build a huge matrix for uh, uh, the organism we are studying. So this matrix can have thousands of rows and columns, but since, it's, since this is a linear system, that's no problem in the computation of, of the results. Okay, there are a lot of models available for many organisms. Uh, one of, some of them uh, make good predictions. So for example, if you take the E. coli model or the Saccharomyces model, uh, it's uh, uh, very likely that the predictions that you make using those models are quite accurate because with all the information that we know of those organisms, we, the models are, are quite, quite good, quite reliable. Uh, but there are other, other uh, models available also, not only for industrial organisms like our Aspergillus, but also for pathogens because these models have been used quite successfully to predict um, drug targets uh, for pathogens, so in a very different applications from what I'm describing here. Uh, but in fact, there are several patents uh, uh, for plasmodium on, on different drug targets that were identified using these, uh, these models and these kind of approaches. So we have done quite some work in this, in this field. Uh, in order to have more and more reliable models because it seems quite straightforward to go to the genome, identify the enzymes that it codifies for, and then build a matrix from that, and of course it is not straightforward. 
so we built a methodology that is uh, now available to perform several of the tasks that are involved in this model construction. For example, one thing is try to look at the enzymes, and what we found out is that quite often the genomes that are publicly available, the annotation uh, was done a long time ago, and a long time ago can be six months in this field, right? So the annotation is probably old, which means that if you run the annotation again, you'll find more enzymes that are being codified by that genome. And uh, what we also found out is that when people do this annotation, when they publish the sequence of the organism, they are not so concerned about enzymes. So they don't identify properly uh, the uh, enzymatic activities. Uh, and we have realized that, uh, uh, and, and, and then we, we decided that for the models we are building, we will have our own annotation process. Uh, so the first thing that we do is try to identify which genes codify for enzymes, and then we have a methodology to attribute the function to those enzymes, which means to associate these enzymes to a given uh, reaction or several reactions. So we use common algorithms like BLAST or, or Markov models, uh, but then we have a platform for curation of, of the results. Another important thing when you are dealing with metabolic engineering is the transport. When I say transport, I mean transport of compounds from the outside to the inside and vice versa. Uh, this is important because uh, uh, it, 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 you need to know uh, if the cells can excrete a given compound that does not uh, diffuse naturally. Uh, and you also need to know if your cells will be able to grow in different uh, carbon sources or, 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 or other nutrients. Uh, so we have also uh, um, implemented a tool that first identifies the transporters and then associates the transporters with a given compound that can be out or in uh, uh, to the cell. Uh, also, an important thing is how uh, these compounds are being transported. Do they need another uh, uh, compound? Do, they need to, do we need to spend ATP in order to transport these compounds? And that's also part of this, of this tool. Another tool, especially for uh, eukaryotes, is where do the reactions take place? So the fact that you identify an enzyme in the genome of your organism uh, does not give you information on uh, in which uh, uh, organelle this, this reaction will, will take place. Uh, there are some tools uh, that we integrated in order to make some prediction about the places where the reactions will take place in, inside the cell, uh, which organelles. So this is a tool that we have uh, uh, developed, it's called Merlin, that does the tasks that I just, uh, I just described. Uh, so, for example, here there is a view on the transport uh, proteins uh, and, and, and uh, on the genes that are associated. Okay. Um, and for, for each enzyme you have the reaction. And of course you, you have to be able to cross your information with information that is in the databases. So you can, you can cross this information with CAG and to other, other databases. Uh, another important thing is the fact that uh, in many databases and in many sources of information, the reactions that you find are not balanced, which means that you don't have the same number of uh, elements in one side of the reaction and in the other. And we also have developed tools uh, for compensating uh, for, for that. Okay, so what you can also do is once you have uh, uh, performed the reannotation with, with, uh, with this tool, uh, and you, once you have built your model, or a draft model, because the model has to be curated a lot after this step, uh, you can uh, visualize your model in the CAG pathways for the ones who are familiar with that. So the CAG is a very, uh, um, very much used database for consulting metabolic uh, information. Uh, although not, not always 100% reliable because it has information on so many organisms that it is not curated. But it has very nice tools to visualize 
uh, like for example this one. So we we uh, uh, use the, the 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 drawings of Keg in order to visualize what we have just developed. So what is in green, it's what we found out that exists in these cases in Cleveromyces lactis uh, uh, in a, with our with our tools. Okay, so we have used this tool for quite a variety of, of different organisms and we are still improving it because this is uh, uh, not uh, 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 an easy task. Uh, but we have recently developed a, a, a genome scale model for Clevaramyces lactis that you don't see so much the results together with Andreas that is sitting just in front. Uh, and we have first, the first thing that we did was to re-annotate the old genome because the annotation that was available was really uh, uh, outdated. Uh, and now we are in the process of validating the model. And one of the things that we use just for example to validate the model uh, is to try to, uh, uh, to try to see if our model predicts the effect of knockouts because this is one of the things that we will use the model for in the future is to try to identify the best knockouts for a given application, for a given compound. And since there are several people that have done knockouts to this organism, we have collected all this information and uh, try to understand if our model was able to predict the effect of knockouts. Uh, here is just a summary. So for example, in vivo, 25 of, of the knockouts exhibit growth. Uh, here it's not a quantitative, but we have the, also done a quantitative analysis. Here is just qualitative. 25 uh, genes originate a growth uh, uh, mutant, uh, and in silica we were able to predict that. We were not able to predict two in this case and two another here, so, uh, but we were quite happy with, this, with these results. And unfortunately, there is not uh, uh, more information available on, on people who have performed knockouts. Uh, for other organisms, uh, we have more, more information. Okay, going to a different field, but it, that is also related with how we build the models. Uh, we are uh, uh, realizing more and more that uh, the information that lays in the literature is being forgotten uh, by people who are doing these uh, uh, predictions and, and, and uh, using uh, informatics tools. Uh, and for example, it's important for us to have uh, an evidence that a certain reaction occurs in a given organism if we have doubts on this, on this reaction. So for example, our genome has a gene that is associated with an enzyme but with a low confidence. And imagine that this enzyme is very uh, important for the predictions we are making. It would be uh, really uh, interesting to have data, experimental data that somebody in the past realized that we have this enzyme in this organism. Uh, but often this information is, is, is not easily uh, accessible. Uh, so we use uh, text mining tools, which are tools that will automatically look for some, some kind of information. Uh, and in this case, we have uh, 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 developed dictionaries to try to identify in a, a set of, for example, 1,000 or 10,000 articles, full text, uh, the presence of a given gene or of a given uh, uh, reaction. Other applications that we use the text mining for uh, are on uh, um, areas that are more related with synthetic biology. So for example, imagine that in a metabolic engineering application, uh, you are looking uh, for, to, to, for an activity that is not present in your uh, original organism. So you need to, to add a pathway. This is becoming more and more common. So you use Saccharomyces or E. coli for producing compounds that they originally cannot produce. Uh, and one question is uh, where to take the genes from? There are usually several combinations. So there are papers, for example, on producing vanillin with Saccharomyces. Of course, Saccharomyces cannot produce vanillin. So you need to add at least four reactions uh, for Saccharomyces to produce this compound. And the question is, what is the best combination of reactions? Because different organisms have different ways of producing not vanillin, but the precursors of vanillin. Uh, so using literature mining and also genome mining can help you uh, to understand which organisms have these capabilities in order to perform the best, the best combination. 
Okay, so this was more about the models. I will now switch to the simulation part. So once you have these models, uh, and if these models are uh, reliable, and this is of course an iterative process, so you start building a model, then you use the model for predictions, and if you realize the predictions are not very, uh, very good, then you go back and you refine, you refine your model. So, but once you have a model that you can use, the question now is how to make predictions with this model. Like I told you, this, uh, these linear models are uh, over the, the, they are underdetermined models, which means that uh, they have not one solution. So they have thousands of, of different solutions. Uh, so we need to have tools that can take these underdetermined models uh, and, and make predictions. Uh, one way to do that is to perform a linear programming for the ones who have uh, learned some math and, and optimization, they know what I'm talking about, but basically it's just doing a mathematical uh, a formulation that will uh, uh, biologically imply that the cells have evolved to maximize their growth. So we are assuming that the cells always try to maximize their growth based on the constraints that they have and on the medium that they have uh, around them. Uh, and th those approaches are called flux balance analysis, but there are several variations on, 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 those, uh, uh, on those methods. But I what I would like to talk about is how to take information from experiments to uh, improve the, uh, the, the estimations that you get with, with your model. <coughs> and here is a summary of the different uh, situations that you will find. Uh, so you have your model, you have the environmental conditions in which you gr usually grow your cells, your, your uh, bacteria or yeast or whatever, and you can also simulate the effects of performing uh, gene knockouts, but you can also have experiments on the measurement of metabolic fluxes. For example, uh, if you are doing a, a batch cultivation, people usually measure uh, the exchange rates for oxygen or carbon dioxide, and those are uh, metabolic fluxes. But you can also use tools that allow you to measure intracellular reaction rates. Uh, I will, I'll talk a bit in the next slide. Uh, but based on this information, you transform this uh, uh, mathematically, and then your system may still be underdetermined, or it could be a determined system or an overdetermined system. Uh, so this means that even if you add measurements, it's, pro it's likely that your, your model is still underdetermined, uh, but uh, the, the, the predictions will be always much better than if you don't add uh, 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 experimental information. And using, having one of these three situations, you can use a variety of tools that I will not go into detail, so if uh, one of you is interested, I'm happy to to, uh, to help you, but this is a variety of methods that you can use to perform simulations if your models are underdetermined, determined, or overdetermined. So probably one of the most complex things in what I was just describing is the measurement of intracellular fluxes. Uh, the way we usually do that is that we label the, the, the uh, um, the carbon source, so which, for example, we use uh, glucose labeled uh, carbon 13, and then we measure uh, the, the proteinogenic amino acids in the GCMS, uh, and for each amino acid, we uh, will have different labeling uh, 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 patterns, and based on these patterns and on the fact that we know uh, the carbon uh, distribution in each of these steps of the metabolism, so this requires quite a lot of information. Uh, but if we know this, and we do know this for uh, uh, pretty much uh, the, all the, the, the organisms that we are using, uh, and then we associate this and this information, and then we are able to predict uh, the values of the internal fluxes, not of all, but of a few, and it all depends on how you design your experiment. Uh, how much you use of labeled um, 
substrate and where is it is labeled. Uh, but if you do a good planning of your experiment, you can get a lot of information uh, on, 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 uh, on the flux distribution. And that, of course, will help you a lot together with the huge model that we have generated from the genome. Uh, together with this information, uh, the predictions that you make for that, for the, that organism really improve a lot. This is just uh, how we uh, uh, integrate this, this uh, uh, experimental data in the simulations. I won't go into details. And having a model able to simulate, that is a very uh, important step. But the question now is, uh, is this is not enough, right? Uh, I can predict what is already there. So I use the model to make predictions of growth on glucose, growth on glycerol. Uh, of uh, growing this mutant and my predictions are okay. So I'm happy with my model, but the question is, how can I use this model for metabolic engineering purposes? Of course, if I do have a good model, one thing is to try and try and try different approaches and see which one would work better for the product that I'm interested in, okay? But, uh, but this is not the most effective way. Uh, and we have come quite some time ago uh, with a formulation of a metabolic engineering problem that we have uh, been using in uh, very different applications. And this formulation is basically, we look at the genome as zeros and ones. Uh, so it's, for example, this is an organism, this is a mutant, and this mutant compared to the wild type strain does not have gene two and gene four. Okay, so I'm able to generate uh, these artificial mutants on the thousands, of course. And what I do next is to see how this impacts the prediction. So in this case, this is my genome. I don't have gene 2 and gene 4. Gene 2 is associated with reaction 2, but, all, but gene 3 is also associated with reaction, with reaction 2. So the fact that this gene is deleted is not a problem because reaction 2 will be there, okay? And in this case, gene 4 is associated with an enzyme uh, that has two reactions associated. And in this case, is reaction 3 and reaction 4. And these are the reactions that will not happen in this mutant. And then I will see how this mutant behaves. Uh, so I take the original model and I perform simulations to try to understand how this mutant will behave. And basically what I'm looking for is for I look at thousands of mutants and I select the ones that have a better performance, for example, in producing succinate or ethanol or whatever I'm, I'm aiming to produce. Uh, the way we then use this is, is that we use evolutionary algorithms that are uh, um, optimization algorithms that are able to deal with these uh, quite complex uh, optimization problems and also simulated annealing, which is another algorithm that uh, we have implemented. And the idea is that these algorithms do all the work. So they will uh, generate thousands or millions of different mutants in the computer, and in the end, they will tell me, this one is the best mutant that I found, but this one looks also good. So I can have like a list of 10 different mutants that seem promising. Of course, I'm not going to the lab to implement these mutants uh, because uh, these models have lots of, of uh, uh, um, inaccuracies. So the first thing that I do with these results is, is I'll try to find a biological, a biological meaning for these uh, mutants. And if I do find, uh, then I go to the lab and implement these, these modifications. So for example, here for the succinate case study, what we realize is this is a very uh, complex metabolic engineering problem as you, for the ones who have ever worked with this compound. Uh, many people a are able to produce succinate with E. coli or with Saccharomyces, uh, but they have lots of genetic modifications in order to do that. And that's what we also saw in the, in the, with our algorithms. So we found out that with two, two mutations, we don't find any organism that is able to produce uh, uh, significant amounts of succinate if these mutations are knockouts. But if we are able to perform four or six gene knockouts, then the productivity improves a lot. Uh, and then uh, uh, um, 
the succinate that we produce is already uh, quite interesting. We use succinate also as a proof of concept of the things that we develop because, like I said, there are many people trying to produce succinate with E. coli or with Saccharomyces, and the, the way they uh, uh, think of their mutants is because they know something about metabolism and they have gases and they go to the lab. And we want to understand if we are able to reach the same results in the blind way. And until now, we have been quite successful in, in, uh, um, in finding the same type of results as they, they have. One of the last things that, that we have done is to use these approaches with some modifications to try to understand the effects of gene over and under expression. So if we are just looking to knockouts, then the, the solutions might be quite complex uh, and you might need to knock out many genes in order to have an organism that produces uh, what you are uh, looking for. So uh, we, do, we did modifications in the algorithms, and I won't go into details, but we did modifications in the algorithms in order to accommodate gene over and under expressions. And you can see here, this was with knockouts and this is with over and under expression. Uh, um, so we see that the, rea the, the, the number of reactions that you need to change are much lower if you are able to, uh, um, to do over and under expressions. <laughs> and one of the, the simplest solutions that we found uh, was one quite obvious, of course. So if you are looking for succinate production, it's usually the case that you, you interrupt the TCA cycle uh, uh, at this step. Uh, in order that succinate can be excreted. But also, one of the things that the algorithm told us is that uh, there is one bottleneck uh, that if we overexpress, then we might be able to improve succinate uh, production. Uh, we haven't uh, validated it, this yet, but we have found some evidences that there might be some uh, bottlenecks uh, uh, above. So there are many other examples, uh, some of them that I will uh, go into more details in, in, uh, in uh, Iwasu. Uh, but I would just like to, for the sake of, of, uh, uh, of being more generic, I will just briefly talk about uh, driving forces. So one of the things that is kind of uh, an important concept in, in metabolic engineering is to identify a driving force. What does it mean? It means that if you want to produce a given compound, then the cell must be obliged to produce that compound in order to, to survive. So if you find a way that the cell has to produce your compound if it, if it wants to survive, then this is a driving force, and this, this is probably the best way that you force the cell to produce your compound. So many of the driving forces that have been described in the literature are related with NADH or NADPH, so the cofactors. Uh, and uh, if you do a search, you'll find that uh, in Saccharomyces or in E. coli or in other organisms, there are many uh, genetic modifications that are uh, related with reactions that consume or that produce NADH or NADPH. In this case, this is a very generic case. So if you are aiming to produce PHBs uh, that are uh, um, also an, uh, an industrially important compound, there is one step here that consumes NADPH. So one driving force, one clear driving force, is to, uh, to have a surplus of NADPH somewhere else in order to force the cells to use this step here to recycle the NADPH. Uh, and there are several steps where you can do that, for example, here by forcing a uh, higher flux into the, into the pentose phosphate, phosphate path, pathway, uh, but there are other alternatives. And one of the things that we have found out is that our algorithms can blindly identify these driving forces, uh, at least in some, in some situations. And if you want to have a good patent on, patent on how to produce a given compound, then a good driving force is the best way, because then you can justify biologically why it makes sense to do these genetic modifications to produce uh, uh, your compound with a different, different organism. <coughs> so just to end, many of these tools that I've just described um, are part of uh, 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 
a, a software that we have produced together with several other uh, uh, partners uh, in, in the scope of an European project, which is Optflux. So Optflux is uh, uh, an open source software. So the idea is to promote uh, the use of this kind of tools by the, the industrial biotech community. Uh, it's also supposed to be user friendly. If you ever use it, let me know. Uh, but the idea is that biologists should be able to use it uh, with some, of course, with some training or with uh, uh, um, studying it before. And also the idea is that it, this is compatible with standards because in this field of in silico uh, uh, or in computational metabolic engineering, one of the uh, uh, bottlenecks is the fact that people do models, but these models are not there for other people to use. Uh, there are some standards, but not always people follow these standards. So if I, if I build a model today, it's very likely that you cannot use this model to make predictions, which of course defeats all the purpose of being a community that uh, is building up on uh, what other people are doing. Uh, so apart from being compatible with standards, we are generating an internal database of available models uh, that we know uh, work uh, and that you can use inside this software because you, nowadays you have models for many of the industrially interesting organisms uh, but the fact is that quite often you cannot use them because uh, they were they have they were done in excel uh, or in any other format so it's and since those are huge models they should be in a, a format that a software can 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 use so the philosophy of this tool is that first, in the first layer, you have your model. And this model, in, in the most basic uh, um, version, is only a psychometric model, but it can also be a model with regulation. This model, you can use this model together with environmental conditions that you define. Environmental conditions is uh, medium composition. Uh, and if you, you can also perform the effect of performing uh, genetic modifications like gene knockouts or gene overexpressions. So this is uh, 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 the, the, the model together with the tools that you need to perform simulations. And then you can use several tools to do those simulations. One is flux balance analysis, which is the most uh, currently used one, but there are other alternatives. And this allows you to get, to determine all the, the, the rates of all the reactions uh, that are happening inside the, the cell. And above that, so this is the predictions, and of course here you can put experimental data to improve your, your results. But above all this, uh, you can perform strain optimization, which, mean, which means that if you, if you want to use this organism here to produce succinate, lactate, whatever compound, uh, then you use the, the, the algorithms that we, we have implemented here and the software will tell you which are the best uh, uh, alternatives. So it's of course up to you to uh, try to uh, interpret those results and see if they make sense. Uh, the advantage is that usually you get several solutions. So you can choose among those solutions the ones that seem to make more, more sense uh, biologically. So this is the way it looks like. Uh, you can have a drawing of your model. Don't see it very well, but this is the model in the format of reactions. So this, some, some are reversible, others are irreversible. This is the panel for performing simulations, and this is the panel for performing optimizations. And like I said, Sol, so this is part of the people that have contributed to, to this work. And like I said, this is a very multidisciplinary work, so we have lots of collaborators in, in different uh, places and all of the ones that are here are, have somehow contributed to what I described before. And these are the ones that actually did all the work, which are the students. Uh, okay. Thanks. I wonder if you could tell us something about being able to predict uh, compounds coming into the cell and coming out of the cell, and to what extent you can do that quantitatively? Quantitatively? Uh, well, this, this, uh, the, the, this model predictions will, uh, if you have a transporter, if you have mm -hmm. identified a transporter or a diffusion, then these this, this, uh, predictions will give you a quantitative prediction. Of, uh, the first of the compounds that you need, 
uh, as inputs, and th th that is probably the most uh, important part, and then of the compounds that need to be secreted in order to have a balanced situation inside the cell. But I'm wondering also, as you change the expression of the different proteins inside the cell, mm -hmm. then of course you can come to a point where you're now limited by transport, but yeah, perhaps yeah. previously you weren't. Sure. And then I'm wondering, do you have an idea about where those points, those break points are between inside of the cell and getting things into the cell or things back out of the cell? No, yeah, that's, uh, now I understand what, what, uh, what you meant. So we only make predictions based on uh, uh, the non-existent of bottlenecks. We can then go back. So the first prediction is always based on steady state uh, yeah. and on the fact that you need to have a balanced situation inside the cell. Uh, what you can do next, and that's what we do in several alternatives, is that you compare these this, uh, fluxes with what you had originally, and the ones that change dramatically, that's very likely that you don't have this capacity. Yeah. Uh, and then you, 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 can, you can try to, to, to see uh, uh, how you would uh, uh, enhance this, these cells. Uh, but there is not, uh, since this is steady state, you cannot do uh, more, more than that, mm -hmm. uh, without data, of course. Uh, but you can identify if the cells, if there are transporters for those compounds, which is already helpful, um, or for families of compounds. This is why we have introduced this transporters uh, tool uh, to try to identify. Uh, so we can go back and say, okay, this is this compound is being generated. Is there a, a transporter that could be used for this compound? Because uh, they are usually families. Thank you, and. Would that be possible to predict the expression of an heterologous gene with, uh, in a plasmid with galactose promoter, for example? Well, what we do with heterologous, uh, uh, so we always have a, a, a vision that does not go into the details because it's not possible to accommodate some details in, this, in these models. But with heterologous genes, we have done lots of, of work with heterologous genes. Uh, and what we do is to try to uh, make a driving force in order to force the, the flux to go into that new pathway. Of course, we don't, again, we don't uh, uh, account for, uh, uh, for bottlenecks in that new pathway, so we don't go into those details. Uh, but we are able to say uh, uh, how to direct the metabolic flux into this new pathway without harming so much the cell, keeping the cell viable, I mean. Um, that's what, the, the, what we have been doing, and it, that becomes easier if that pathway has some huge usage of um, cofactors. If not, then, then it becomes quite complicated to have a driving force uh, in order to, to promote the, the flux into that new pathway because the cell has no reason to go there. That's what you see often, right? So I found it very interesting what you said about the enzyme kinetics uh, research, that people were doing that and then they stopped and now they may be doing it again. But could you comment a little bit on the fact that these kinetic equations were usually uh, obtained in vitro and how far are they valid for an in vivo situation, which is what happens in your cell? Well, uh, we have done this analysis for E. coli, uh, where we have a detailed kinetic model for, the, um, for the, the, the central carbon metabolism. And surprisingly, if you take the in vitro uh, data that uh, has been obtained in uh, not extreme conditions, it does improve a lot the predictions, uh, and, and it seems to be quite useful. So it's not accurate, uh, but it does improve a lot the predictions uh, so if it's not in, in, in extreme situations, and actually uh, there are some, some, uh, some uh, papers on, on also proving that. Uh, so it's a good approximation even though uh, we know that those, you have lots of different conditions uh, that people have determined these kinetic parameters. It seems that if those are not extreme cases, then it's, it's, uh, it's still useful uh, to constrain um, uh, the, the predictions. But then you have to recalculate the values of the parameters. Yes, least. yes. Okay. But it's a good first estimation. Uh, but now people are, uh, there are several projects, I don't know the stage of those, but there are several projects, there are some, some standards on the determination of kinetic parameters for models. And uh, there, is a, so there are some efforts of people doing that in, on a high throughput 
uh, scale for E. coli. So the idea is that in a few years we will have all the parameters uh, for most of the, the enzymes in uh, uh, all determined in the same way. I don't know the state of this project. Yeah, I think I read something from uh, Hans Westerhof. He, they were trying to use in vitro conditions that are very similar to the in vivo yeah, conditions. There are protocols yeah. for that, yes. Okay. But I don't know how far they, 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 they are now. Do you also evaluate the intellectual property rights that are associated with certain genetic modifications or with certain genes that you introduce into the organisms? Because for companies, this is actually equally important as having a good production organism. Yeah, because we are in this uh, borderline where some of the things we do might become industrially relevant. We, that's why we have spin-off where people take care of, this, of these things. Uh, because at the university, what we do mostly is to look at the methods and validate the methods with things that are already published. So we are not very much concerned on generating new IP uh, because that's not what we are aiming. So that's, that's one of the reasons we created a spin-off that can deal with those things and look at more uh, a specific uh, uh, case studies. And, uh, uh, but yeah, there you have to, to, to not only about heterologous pathways, but also on the strategies to promote the flux through. Uh, and, and that way we found out together with, with uh, in the company, together with the larger companies, that many of these things are patentable. Uh, even though, if you, don't, if you don't even have a proof in the lab, they are patentable, patentable if, if, if it makes sense. So if the strategy of directing a flux into a given compound makes sense, if you are able to explain it, then you can already patent. Uh, well, that's interesting. In silico, you mean, without yes. yeah. uh, experimental evidence. Yeah. I didn't know that. I also <laughs> didn't. <laughs> yes, we're also learning a lot on, on, uh, this, on this field. I'd like to ask a, a, a last question before we go for the next uh, talk. More kind of philosophical question. You, you actually, uh, how important dynamic models should be I mean, you need a driving force to people who go after those kinetic parameters. Uh, and uh, even to create new equipment for high throughput, uh, etc. Are they really necessary? How do you see this in the future? For... The, the more I know, the more I think they are dramatically necessary. Because uh, especially if you are looking at new organisms, um, you don't know much about those organisms, so the degrees of freedom in the predictions are huge. Uh, so in the end, you cannot make good uh, metabolic engineering uh, strategies. And if you have these parameters, what we have shown, I haven't discussed this work because it's quite complex, but we have shown is that even if you have parameters for just few reactions, that already helps to, to improve. You don't even need to enter with those in the simulations. But what I feel is that people associate these kinetic parameters with performing simulations with dynamic equations. And for the size of these models, this is even, there is even a computational, computational issue um, in, in doing these simulations. So that's why I think people are not so motivated. But uh, if they have a broader uh, approach, uh, they would realize that, that uh, it can help any kind of simulation, the fact that you have parameters.